I think I live in a world where everyone is right. It doesn't matter what I think, everyone is just right. You know, in this context, your professor is right. Your parents are right. The law is right. The protesters, the people outside yelling, oh, you increase minimum wage and all, they are right. So everyone is right. We're all just trying to have a voice in a world where everyone has voices. And so, how do I see life? It's just this very noisy, noisy environment where everyone wants to say something and they all want to be heard at the same time. And so I don't struggle. I, I go with it. I blend in. I do what I need to do. And I crawl back home to my bed and sleep every day. So growing up, I did feel pulled between white and black because that was, that was the main gr ethnic group of people that I was around. However, I am not just white and I am not just black. I am both and then some. I am the world, basically, <laughs> when you think about it. I have ancestors from every continent. But what I'm getting at is that growing up multiracial in a pale-skinned body invokes this dissonance with your external and your internal because people see you and they, and they think that you're white because you're pale and then they treat you like a white person when in fact inside you are not. So what I've always wanted is not to have necessarily this beautiful ebony indigo skin but it is to look more ethnic so that I can pass as myself, which is a terrible thing to say. But if I, I've always thought if I could just be a little taller, if I could just have darker skin and curlier hair, people would see me and wonder, oh, what is she? You know, and then treat me as such, treat me as a multiracial being, as the multiracial being that I am. I think that the part that plays out the most in my life is definitely being gay. Just because with the gender identity thing, I can pass for male. With like my agnosticism, no one's gonna know that until they start speaking to me. But like when it comes to like the gay thing, I have people that tell me every day that when they see me, they can tell. And I always wonder what's going to happen one day whenever someone notices and they don't like that. So during spring break, there was this event on campus where um, a few Danish folks, Danish athletes came to Berea to perform in the high school. And the students, some students stayed with my host family. And so they invited me to the country dance. I think it was an old town. There's this old folk center. And coming down there, I felt because, you know, there was, we had Danish people coming in and we had different people coming in. I felt it was going to be diverse. And so there wouldn't be much tension, like me just having to deal with most folks from the South. And when I got there and the events began, I noticed, you know, you know how it is where you're at an event and you want to be social and you approach people and you introduce yourself, depending on who smiles at you or who's welcoming. When I walked in, there were different people who only gave this one second smile. It's almost as if they didn't really want to engage me. It was just like, we have this mini second eye contact and just, you just smile and they walk away so you don't have the chance to start up a conversation. And it was good. It was good until the party started and we all started dancing around. And you know, it's this kind of old folks dance where people go around and you pick a partner and you move around and you pick another partner. And this went on for like 20, 30 minutes. I was having fun, I was sweating until I actually noticed I was the only black person in that room, which was weird for me because I had expected that the community would have black people. But then when we kept moving around, I noticed after a while, my next partner was like a 10, 12 year old little girl. And when she saw me after spinning around and we were supposed to hold hands and dance around, when she saw me, she ran back in fright. I mean, you could actually see the fright on her face. It felt as if she had never been exposed to a person of color before.
On being biracial, it's almost as if you are the slave being raped by the slave owner every day inside of your head because of apartheid in South Africa, because of Jim Crow in the United States. It's that war for desegregation inside of you all the time. Whenever you have like this identity and like for me, being gay is, an, is like one of the identities that I do live through. I do find, I guess, a home uh, with other people that are also identify as the same. Um, but the thing is, we're not, we're all different individuals. We don't, while we all do identify as gay, the concept of gayness is going to be different for every single individual. We each have our own definition of it. We have our own self-expression of it. So, I guess like whenever you think of like society's idea of being gay, it's really harmful because it's forcing you to fulfill a certain expectation. And if you're gonna like live and be 100% authentically yourself, you can't do it for like anyone else. You have to be able to do it for yourself. People do n cannot comprehend the fact that it is possible to be both the snow of the Netherlands and the jungle roots of the Congo. And that it is possible for those things to coexist. And that's what I am. I am the snow of the Netherlands. I am the roots of Mali. I am Spanish. I am anything you can put your finger on. And so when people assume that you are one thing and approach you as you are one thing, you are diminished from a complex being to just a piece of meat. In an environment where she would have to hold hands with a, you know, a black guy and move around in circle, and I mean, it was strange for her. She's sweet, she's innocent. I'm not judging or saying she was racist. I'm just saying, I try to put myself in her shoes. I try to see the world from her perspective. And I realized, how would I have felt if all my life I've been amongst you know, my folks and all of a sudden there's this entity of a different color that my parents never talk about, that my teachers never talk about, that my friends never talk about, that we never even see in media, who never even comes to speak to us in our classroom. How would I feel if this person comes up to me twice my height, comes up to me and grabs my hand and dances with me? I must have felt like a demon or a masquerade or something. I don't know what she thought, but she physically withdrew and that just, that spoke volumes. I truly just believe I have this in my, in my blood. Um, so I think that it's internal, I think it's external. I think it's both. I think part of it is valid, that part that is in my blood, my DNA, like I said, I have DNA from every corner of this planet, no matter how pale I am. And I think that my an I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And I think that that f comes out, I think that that shows itself in my life. And then also I think that some of it's not valid. I think that some of it is just growing up the way that I did and being convinced of certain stereotypes or unconvinced of certain stereotypes, if you will. So I think that why race is such a big deal to me is both valid and invalid. Um, I don't think that I should care about skin color as much as I do. I, I honestly don't. I kept thinking about it, you know? It wasn't about the fact that I was at an event where I was the only black guy, which is why most of the times when people invite me, maybe friends, invite me to their homes for, you know, Thanksgiving or something, the question I ask is, where is it? Are there gonna be more black people there? Like, you know, because you want to be comfortable. I'm not saying people of different color makes me uncomfortable, but it's just, you just never know what you're thinking. You know, you never know how or what you do that is a norm back home might be offensive to them, or you never know how you might be a threat just by being different. So it's, I don't know, it's crazy. That scene was born in my mind. 
I, it's, I don't think it's something I can ever forget.